Okay, it's 2.30, so good afternoon, and thank you for joining Farm Credit East and Crop Growers for the Livestock Gross Margin Dairy versus the Margin Protection Program webinar. Um, today we'll look at the uh, compare and contrast the two programs and talk about some strategies. Uh, a few tech notes before we begin. Um, there should be on the right-hand side of your screen a little control panel for GoToWebinar. You can tech, type in questions at any point during the presentation. Following all the presentations, we will address the questions at that time. Um, if you have any uh, urgent matters, you can chat them in, and uh, we will respond if you can't hear or something like that. Um, a recording of this presentation will be available online at farmcredities.com slash webinars. It will be posted by Monday. Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jim Putnam, who will introduce our speakers. Okay, thank you, Chris, and good afternoon to uh, all of our attendees this uh, uh, today. We really appreciate your joining us for this program, especially on short notice. Uh, and I uh, want to also thank our presenters. Uh, this all came about uh, fairly quickly, uh, and we recognized through questions we, we, we were receiving at Crop Growers and at Farm Credit East uh, that there was a need for some additional uh, content and, and uh, perhaps strategy type uh, input. Uh, as uh, dairy producers are making these important decisions uh, this month. So uh, this all came about very quickly and really appreciate the presenters uh, responding uh, and uh, putting this program together. So uh, here's our format, folks. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, all four of our presenters uh, right now. And then as each of them um, uh, hands off to the next presenter, they'll just uh, uh, say their name, and we'll transfer uh, control of the program over to the next uh, speaker. That will help, help us uh, move along fairly quickly. Then when we're all done, I'm going to come back uh, and moderate any uh, questions that you may have texted into us. Again, as Chris said, we really encourage you uh, to take advantage of the opportunity to uh, ask these four experts uh, any questions that you've got on your mind that help you and others on the program to better understand this program. So again, uh, before we get started with the uh, introductions, I just want to thank all of you on behalf of Crop Growers Insurance Agency and Farm Credit East for attending today. Our first uh, speaker is Allison Jones Brimmer. Uh, she is Northeast Marketing Agent and Dairy Product Specialist with uh, crop growers, and she's going to uh, do some basic presentation on the uh, LGM program. Uh, she will be followed by David Holt, who is County Executive Director for the Washington, Warren, and Saratoga County Farm Services Agency, which of course is part of the USDA, and he will uh, provide some ex explanation on the milk margin protection program. David will be followed by Sandy Buxton. Uh, she is Farm and Ag Business Educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Washington County. She's going to add some additional perspective on the Milk Margin Protection Program. And uh, back, uh, cleanup batter uh, for today's program uh, is Bill Zweigbaum, Business Consultant with uh, Farm Credit East. And Bill is one of our uh, senior consultants uh, here at Farm Credit East. And uh, somebody whose uh, viewpoints and uh, insights on the dairy industry are, are among my most valued uh, on our team here at Farm Credit East. So great uh, set of speakers for you. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Allison. Take it. Thank you. Hey, Allison, I'm just transferring to you. Thank you. All right. Can we see my slide? All right. I um, just want to start off with a disclaimer that um, we're giving this presentation as some general guidance, and that nothing shared today is replacing any of the provision, provisions of these policies um, or rulings by FSA. So um, we encourage everyone to follow up with the appropriate people if they want further details on any of the programs discussed today. So I'm going to start off by discussing what the LGM Dairy Program is. It's the Livestock Gross Margin Dairy Program. 
It's a federally subsidized dairy insurance that protects the margin between milk revenue and feed costs on the farm. So it's going to uh, protect the class three milk price minus the feed of corn and soybean meal costs. It's going to set an established price the three days leading up to an enrollment date. And then that established or expected margin is going to be compared to um, the actual prices during the months insured. So you've got an expected versus actual, and the difference between those um, margins are what the program is protecting. One key point and reason why uh, there's definitely a lot more discussion today about dairy risk management is because you cannot participate in both the LGM dairy program and the uh, margin protection program through FSA. So to put some numbers to this, if uh, you enrolled in LGM Dairy with um, uh, Class 3 milk futures looking ar around $17 per hundredweight, a feed cost of about $2.50 per hundredweight, and then you choose a deductible, in this example, a $1 deductible, means that your gross margin guarantee or your expected margin is $13.50. So if anything happens, uh, on the mar in the markets to shrink that uh, margin below 1350, it would trigger a claim payment. So in this example, um, if milk price goes down some and feed price goes up some, you would have an actual milk price, class three milk price of 1550, an actual corn and soybean meal price of $3, leaving you with a $12.50 actual gross margin. The difference between the, the um, gross margin guarantee and the actual gross margin of $1 would be per, paid on a per hundred weight basis back to the producer who had this policy. LGM Dairy is fairly customizable. There are uh, some flexibilities within the program that allow you to help it fit your farm's needs the best. The first thing that you choose would be the amount of milk to insure each month. You can, you can enroll two months to 10 months in any one enrollment. So there will be an enrollment next week, November 21st, that's next Friday. You can choose to enroll milk through um, starting in January of 2015 through October of 2015. You can choose any two or an all up to all 10 of those months. You can ensure up to 100% of your monthly production. So it doesn't really matter what your historical production has been, um, just what you expect to produce in the next year on a monthly basis, you can enroll in the program as long as it does not exceed 240,000 hundredweight per policy year. For the feed, you can choose to use your on-farm feed values. You would convert your entire uh, milking herd's diet to corn and soybean meal equivalent, or you can utilize a default feed value which is provided by the program. That default feed value is what it takes to produce that amount of milk insured. So it's covering the amount of feed to feed the milking cows only. Then you choose a deductible, which is between $0 and $2 at 10 cent increments. This is going to depend on what your risk tolerance is on the farm. The deductible heavily influences the cost of the coverage, so that's a, a key factor in decision making. And there's also different subsidy levels at each deductible. So um, you maximize the federal subsidy at the $1.10 deductible. So we see most producers using a dollar or a dollar ten as their deductible level to try to maximize that um, federal subsidy. You do not choose the milk price and the feed prices, which is one of the complexities of the program that makes it a little bit challenging to understand how it's going to affect your farm. 
uh, the, pol the policy uses the class three milk price and uh, corn and soybean futures so corn and soybean meal futures prices, and they, um, the set prices will be the average of the futures on the three days leading up to the enrollment. So next week it would be the 18th through the 20th average together for the 21st enrollment. Um, one thing to consider when trying to make decisions, uh, although it is hard to fully understand the relationship between your on-farm costs, your mailbox prices, and the market prices. Just keep in mind that if, in general, your market prices move, or I'm sorry, your farm prices move up and down in similar manner that the market price does, uh, it's going to, the program will respond when you need it to, um, because typically when the market is bad, might not match up dollar for dollar with how your farm prices are, but if the market is bad, the margins are smaller on the market, it's going to translate to your farm having uh, tight margins as well. I'm going to go through a few different examples of what, how this program has played out in the past. These um, examples are all using the $1 deductible and default feed values. The blue line shows you what the expected margin was if you purchased a contract in the fall of the previous year. So here, if you purchased a, a contract in the fall of 2013 for the, um, some of the months into 2014, the expected value that you um, would have been insuring was somewhere in the $13 range. The actual margin was above $13 for every month throughout that enrollment, so there would be no payment to the producer in this scenario. The producer, however, was able to um, hopefully see positive margins on the farm in that they were getting paid a good price for their milk. They had lower feed costs. Uh, so you would owe the bill at the end of this contract, but hopefully your farm was doing well because margins were high. 2013, we saw a little bit more volatility. So uh, the blue line, again, is the expected margin, but the actual margin was up and down throughout the whole year. Uh, if someone had a shorter term contract, so these first four months, December of 2012 into um, March or April of 2013, they would have seen a payment on this policy but someone with the entire 10-month period enrolled would not see a payment because the policy is cumulative. So the good months washed out the bad months, and overall there was no loss throughout the 10 months. So that is what this chart is explaining is the difference between a shorter contract and a longer contract for the 2013 year. This is going back to 2009, so if you had purchased the contract in October of 2008 for, um, you could have enrolled milk in December of 2008 to September of 2009 at that time. The expected margin was hovering around the $11 mark. Margin stayed pretty good in December and then started falling off in January and stayed low for a majority of the year. This contract uh, would have had a net payment back to producers at $2.50 per hundredweight. It would have been an even larger payment if December was not enrolled. So um, it definitely looking at November enrollment, December is not an option for you. Uh, so you would, the first month you can enroll is January. This is what margins are, were looking like as of two days ago with, um, for the 2015 year. This is the, the um, expected margin. There's no deductible accounted for here, but it is using the default feed values. So this expected margin column is what is available to producers to protect at this point. But remember that this changes up until the the, the enrollment date because it's the average of the three days of 
uh, of the before the enrollment. So as of right now, we're looking at a sixteen to seventeen dollar milk class three milk price throughout next year into October. Then um, two fifty to to uh, just under three dollar feed cost for the year, and then that equaling out to uh, fourteen dollars to uh, mostly 14 to 14.50 of what can be protected using LCM dairy. The biggest question is always what's the cost of the coverage? It's very dependent on the months, the deductible, and the margin. So if you're interested in looking at the program, I really encourage you to talk to a crop growers agent and talk more specifically about what policy or what strategy you'd like to use because in reality the the cost can range anywhere from five cents a hundred weight to just under a dollar per hundred weight. Most of the policies I've seen range from twenty to forty cents per hundred weight. The policy is billed at the end of the insurance period. So if you enrolled in November of 2014, you'd have to pay the bill in November of 2015 and it does not protect against loss of milk production. So you have to produce at least the amount of milk that was insured or any indemnities that you are owed would be reduced. The information that I use and the great decision making tool is available to producers uh, at the University of Wisconsin dairy site. It's also available through the uh, dairymarkets.org which is where the MPP tool is. So you can go to either location to find this premium estimator. You input what um, month and deductible you'd like to choose and click on default feed values or enter man manually to input your own feed values. You then select your month that you would like to look at, the amount of milk you'd like to look at ensuring, and if you want to input your own feed values, you, you would do that under the corn equivalents and soybean equivalents columns. Then click LGM premium, calculate LGM premium. It brings up a summary tab showing you the cost per uh, covered, 100 weight of covered milk, and then some further detail on the cost and the margin that you are protecting. Just to touch base on the enrollment process, the next enrollment is Friday, November 21st. There is an enrollment the last business Friday of every month that there is funding available for the program. Um, you need to fill out an application prior to the uh, enrollment date and get it turned into us preferably by noon on that Friday. You have to include the amount of production that you would like to ensure and your expected feed or the default feed values listed, what months you'd like to insure, and the deductible that you have chosen. Uh, and then enrollment is on a national first come first serve basis while the funding is available. So we would work to get your contract submitted uh, on Friday evening and let you know uh, the following week if it's been accepted or not. I'll wrap up with a couple of advantages and disadvantages of the LGM dairy program. It is very customizable to your farm. If you're interested in just starting with smaller quantities to learn more about the program, the amount of milk you insure is, is entirely up to you, so you can do that. Your premium are subsidized and due at the end of the contract. It provides a floor without taking away the highs, so like in 2014, um, when markets actually did better than expected, you're still able to take those highs in the, the market uh, with your on-farm prices. And you have the ability to track your results through the website I had demonstrated through the analyzer. On the other hand, it is a complex uh, relationship between the mailbox price and what's actually going on in the market. Uh, feed conversions can be detailed. If you're interested in using your own feed values, I definitely encourage you to start early on that process. And then the other um, downfalls of the program are that short sales period on that Friday and only available if funding is provided. 
So there's a overview of the LGM Dairy Program. I'd like to, at this point, pass it along to, um, to David Holtz of FSA to give an overview of the Margin Protection Program. Hi, David, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Can everyone hear me? Yep, we hear you just fine. And can you see the screens? Yep. Very good. Thank you. My name is Dave Holk. I do work for Farm Service Agency. I've been with the agency for 30 years. And what I want to do is give a brief overview of the Dairy Margin Protection Program, uh, or MPP Dairy. Um, the MPP Dairy Program is optional. It is a program that replaces the MILC program that uh, most dairy producers were enrolled in. And um, coverage is available for 2014 to 2018. And although we're not supposed to give any casual advice, um, it would be, in my opinion, uh, not wise to sign up for 2014 because we pretty much know what our margins are and things are still uh, looking good in 14. We only have a few months left. Uh, 2015, however, um, I think all producers need to be taking a, a good look at that. And um, as often happens in the government, things change. So uh, my PowerPoint has not been updated. But if you could write down that the deadline for 14 and 15 is no longer November 28th, which happens to be Black Friday, and uh, they decided that maybe that wasn't a good day to have as a deadline and that Thanksgiving the offices are closed and uh, some employees may uh, be doing some Christmas shopping then, so your new deadline is Friday, December the 5th. December the 5th is your deadline for MPP sign-up for 2014 and 2015. Uh, what MPP Dairy does is it offers protection against low margins. Uh, margins are a little bit different than LGM Dairy, and we'll talk about that. And then producers are, are receive a payment when the margin falls below the coverage level that they have selected. This screen here shows the margin. One of the differences between LGM Dairy, LGM Dairy is Allison, uh, just pointed out uses the class three milk futures price. Uh, MPP Dairy uses the national all milk price. So this is more, I think, what we would refer to as a mailbox price nationally. Um, they also use a national average feed cost determined by the cost of feed used to produce a single hundred weight of milk. And um, this is based on a formula uh, some university folks figured out uh, for a herd with average production, which I believe in the U.S. now is about 21,800 pounds per cow. Uh, what would it cost to feed a typical herd of milking cows, dry cows, bred heifers, calves, the entire, uh, the entire uh, uh, dairy herd? And um, the margin for MPP dairy is calculated in six two-month intervals. So it's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, and so forth. A national all milk price, once again, is the average price of milk marketed in the U.S. as reported by NAST, the National Agricultural Statistical Service. Okay, um, how do we calculate this national average feed cost? Well, we use a corn price in, uh, in dollars per bushel as reported by the Ag Marketing Service. We use soybean meal price in central Illinois and an alfalfa hay price are reported by AMS. And then there's a mathematical conversion for each of these ingredients that uh, would end up showing what we would need to, to feed our cattle. Now we know that um, you know there's probably not one dairy herd in the country that just feeds uh, grain corn, soybean meal, and alfalfa hay. But as major ingredients for rations, those are the, are the commodities that are used for this calculation. Payments are issued based on margins during those two consecutive months we talked about, January, February, March, April, and so forth. One of the big differences between the MILC program and MILC, uh, once a dairy had produced 2.985 million pounds of milk, they were capped and could no longer receive any payments. So a lot of our dairy farmers may have only got a payment based on three weeks, four weeks, five weeks of production, and then did not receive any more payments under MILC for the rest of the year where the farmer milking 60, 70, 80 cows would have continued to get paid. Under this program, 
regardless of the size of the producer. You could be milking 30,000 cows and you can ensure 90%, up to 90% of your production just like the farmer milking 50 cows would. However, we'll see shortly that for those larger farms, there's a difference in cost per hundredweight for the first 4 million pounds and then pounds over 4 million. Payments under MPP dairy are based on the production history and what percentage of the production history the producer elects to insure. They're not based on current production. Under MILC, if you produced 100,000 pounds of milk in October and the rate was 20 cents a hundredweight, that's how the payment was calculated. Under margin protection, we're calculating that payment based on the production history. Um, new dairy operations have two different methods to establish their production history. And the first option is um, basically the number of months the operation ship milk extrapolated over to a yearly amount. And the second method is rather interesting. You, the farmer would just certify the number of cows that they're actually milking, the number of mature cows in the herd, multiplied by the national rolling herd average, which is 21,822 pounds per cow. Now, the one thing I find very interesting here is there is no, uh, no stipulation based on what breed of cows you're milking or your production level. So, you know, growing up on a registered Holstein farm, um, you know, your, your Holsteins typically produce, you know, much more milk than maybe a, a crossbred rotational grazer, but under this option, everyone gets the same national average regardless of the breed of cows that they are milking. Your production history is then going to be 2011, 2012, 2013, whichever year is the highest. So what farmers should be doing now is bringing in some evidence from their milk company to show how much milk they shipped in these three years, 2011, 2012, and 2013, and whatever the highest year was, that will be your production history. And that history is assigned to the operation, not the individual. It will never be reduced because of any changes in the herd size of the operation or changes in national milk production. That production history can be increased by an adjustment factor, which a uh, farm service agency is referring to as the bump. And what this reflects is national average changes in milk production. For example, in 2014, our milk production nationally went up less than 1%. It would have been 0.87%. So any farm or farmer that signs up and participates in 2015 under margin protection will take their production history and for 15 it will be increased by 1.0087. Then in 2016, for example, if national production is about 4%, we'll increase your production history by 4%. If the next year it's up 3%, you'd increase it by 3%. So each year that bump amount is announced in, in, in May and then it is applied to the production history, and that is the only way you can increase your production history. Now, if you add 300 cows and you know your milk production goes up 25%, you're only going to get increased by what that national amount is. If national production goes down, your production history will not be decreased. And you will get this bump or national increase regardless of what is going on in your own herd. So you know, the one example I just gave, guy adds 300 cows. Well, the opposite is also true. Let's say you're milking 200 cows and you downsize to 100. You will still get the bump and your production history will increase because we're going back to 2011, 2012, and 2013. That is your production history throughout the program with the only increase uh, coming through the bump. MPP Dairy offers dairy producers um, many different options. The catastrophic coverage, which is similar to uh, CAT for crop insurance, is a $4 margin protection level, 90% of your production history covered, and there is a $100 annual administrative fee. Uh, there is no premium at this level. So it's $4 protection, $100 administrative fee. Then buy-up coverage offers them many choices. The producer can cover anywhere between $4.50 and $8 margin protection in 50% yeah, excuse me, 50 cent intervals. 
and producers can select 25 to 90 percent of their production history to ensure or to cover in 5 percent increments, so 25, 30, 35, 40, and so forth. Uh, there is also a $100 annual administrative fee for folks that are going to buy up. And the premium is going to be based on the coverage level and the percent of production that the dairy farmer wishes to ensure. Uh, this table here is going to show you the different tiers and uh, the different coverage levels. So you see the coverage levels range from four to eight dollars. At the four dollar coverage level, there is no premium. Uh, it says none in there. However, there is a hundred dollar administrative fee. Uh, tier one is going to be your premiums for production history at four million pounds or less. So you will notice the cost per hundred weight in tier one is less than tier two. Tier two would be four million pounds or greater. Uh, the other thing we're going to do for producers who ensure less than four million pounds is for 2014 and 2015, they're going to receive a 25% um, reduction in their premium compared to 2016 through 2018. So for example, if you look at the $6.50 level of coverage, uh, for 14 and 15, the, the rate is um, 6.8 cents per hundredweight, where 16 through 18, it would be 9 cents per hundredweight. As opposed to a farm insuring over 4 million pounds, the rate is 29 cents a hundredweight. So you can see that there, there, there is a significant difference under 4 million over 4 million. Now, as far as the cost of premiums go, some strategy can be used here. If I'm a dairy farmer and I produce 16 million pounds is my production history, if I choose to insure 25% of that, that's 4 million pounds, I'm going to pay the lower rate. So my premiums would be less, however, I'm only covering 25% of my production history. Um, there is a a web tool that actually Allison referred to earlier, and uh, I do not have this on any of my slides, so I'll, I will I will uh, say it uh, slowly and I'll repeat it twice. The, the web tool uh, that, that you can use to put in your actual production history, you can put in your different coverage levels, you can change the variables and see what your cost would be. You can also go back and look at some historical things like uh, if this program had been around in our years of 2009 and 2012 when we had extremely low margins, you know, what would the return have been? Or in years like uh, 2010 or 2011 when the margins were strong and there would have been no return, uh, you can play around with some pretty good charts and stuff to look out there. But the web tool is www.fsa.usda.com gov backslash mpp tool. Once again, www.fsa.usda.gov backslash mpp tool. Uh, producers that don't have access to a computer, if they want to, you want to come into your local FSA office, we'd be more than glad to uh, sit down with you and put in your uh, own numbers and show you what your premiums would be in any scenario that you would like to look at. Uh, there's actually 126 different combinations, believe it or not, between between uh, nine different coverage levels, between four and eight dollars, and between 14 different levels of coverage, between 25 and 90 percent of your uh, production history. Okay, what are the options for paying your premiums? Well. Option one is to pay 100% of the premium before the end of the coverage election period. And um, option two is you pay at least 25% of the premium by February 1st of the calendar year of coverage, and the remaining balance is due June 1st. Uh, if you don't pay that 25% minimum by February 1st, you're gonna, the result is a loss of coverage. You can't come in in March and say, oops, here's, here's my money. Nope, you're, you're, you're done for the year as far as coverage. Um, and premium balances outstanding prior to June 1st will be deducted from any payments that are triggered. Uh, the $100 service fee, however, is due by the deadline, which once again for 14 and 15 would be 
December the 5th. Other thing I neglected to mention on the past on the screen back, which I'll go back one, these premium rates here are locked in through 2018. Uh, they will not change. That is part of the law and they are good through 2018. Now, payments. FSA offices are going to pay dairy farmers um, when a participating dairy operation, when the average production margin for a consecutive two-month period is less than the margin trigger elected by the dairy operation. So depending what, indiv what the individual farm elected uh, for their coverage level will determine if or how much they get paid. Um, little table here uh, just shows uh, those two-month pairs that we talked about and what you can look for for timing. So in other words, if uh, a payment is issued in January, if January, February triggers a payment, we're going to know the, the figures, corn, soybean, hay, milk prices in March, and farmers should receive their payment in April. And as you go down through, for example, September, October, payments made in December. Uh, one thing you can safely say, if the margin is above $8, for 100 weight, nobody gets a payment. Okay, you cannot cover any margin above eight dollars. If the margin is below four dollars, anyone, everyone gets a payment then. If the margin is below four, which that's pretty bad, but that did ha happen for uh, most of 2009 and actually for f four months in 2012 as well. And then if the margin is somewhere between four and eight dollars, it just depends on um, what level of coverage that individual farm selected. Okay, so here's a screen I think folks want to take a good look at. This is how do we, how does the math actually work on this? Um, how do I actually calculate what my payment would be? So in this example here, we have a farm that has a production history of 3 million pounds, and they chose to cover 90% of that 3 million pound production history. So they're covering 2,700,000 pounds or 27,000 hundredweight. In our example here, this farm had elected to cover a margin at $6.50. So they paid for the $6.50 coverage. That coverage would be good for the entire year. Um, let's just assume that's 2015. And then the national calculated margin for the two-month period comes in at $6.05. So the difference is the $0.45 cents per hundredweight. And what we would do here, we would pay 45 cents a hundredweight on the covered production, which is the 2.7 million pounds, and the payment rate $12,150. And then we divide it by six. Well, why would we divide by six? Well, the reason we do that is the insured production at 2.7 million pounds was for the entire year, and there's six two-month periods in the year. So you're insuring your production for the entire year, and we're looking at six two-month periods. Each two months are averaged together and calculated separately, and that is how we would arrive at the payment. Now, in looking at this, if the neighbor bought coverage at $5, they would not receive a payment because that $6.05 margin was greater than $5. If they purchased coverage at $7 instead of $6.50, the payment would be $0.95, cents, $7 minus $6.05, and so forth. So that is how we would calculate our payments under MPP Dairy. How do you participate in MPP Dairy? Well, the first step, and this is something that I would encourage every dairy farmer to do, whether they end up signing up for LGM Dairy, for margin protection, or for neither program and that is to establish your production history on what we have a CC781 form, which is very simple. The form has on it how much milk did you produce in 2011, 12, and 13. You write the numbers in. You bring in documentation from your uh, milk company as to how much milk you shipped, and then we have that recorded on file because that production history is what's going to be used all the way through 2018. So suppose that a farmer elects not to sign up now for either program. There will be sign-ups again 
for margin protection for 2016 sign ups July 1st through September 30th of 15. For 2017, it's July 1st through September 30th of 2016. And for 2018, it's July 1st through September 30th of 2017. So let's just for argument's sake say farmer chooses not to participate. We end up with three more good years. And then in the summer of 2017, it looks like milk prices are going to drop for 2018 and feed's going to go up. So the producer comes into the office then and wants to sign up in 2017. Well, they're going to have to establish their production history with 11, 12, and 13 records. And now you're three or four years after the fact, it might be a little bit harder to put your hand on that production history and pull it out. You know, maybe it's in the filing cabinet in the cellar somewhere. So do this now. There's no cost associated with it. Then if something changes, your production history has already been established at the FSA office if you decide to sign up in the future. Now the second step, if you're looking to sign up uh, now for 2014 or 15 by December 5th, is a 782 form. And this is basically a form where you're going to select what level of coverage you want between $4 and $8 and what percentage of your production history that you want to cover. And then by December 5th, you would also pay the $100 annual administrative fee. And then last but not least, you need, with all USDA programs and benefits, whether it's margin protection, whether it's the new ARC PLC programs, which are for corn and soybean base, whether it's for an FSA direct loan, whether it's for an FSA loan that's guaranteed by Farm Credit East, or whether it's subsidized insurance, farmers have to certify that they're complying with highly erodible and, and wetland provisions. Just as a recap now, the first step is to establish your production history. Once established, the opportunity to increase your production history is only through that bump, which is the national average increase in production. Uh, dairy operations need to select one coverage and one margin, but that's for a, a, only a one-year period. For example, if you think margins are going to remain very strong in 2015 and your chances of payment are going to be remote, you may decide you only want to participate at the $4 level, 90% and plunk down the $100. If next year it looks like things are going in the wrong direction and you want better coverage, next year you can come in between July and the end of September and decide, hey, you know, now I want to cover at the $650 or the $7 or the $8 level or wherever you want to do. So it's, it's a one year. Each year you can change uh, both your level of coverage and the margin that you wish to protect. Once again, this, as I said earlier, this slide needs to be updated. The registration period is December 5th. Friday, December 5th is the deadline. Something important to consider. Once you're enrolled in margin protection, you're enrolled until December 31st, 2018. So at a minimum, that is a, would be a commitment. If you pluck down, pluck down $100 for 15, you also need to do a minimum of 100 for 16, 17, and 18 which obviously is 400 bucks. Uh, what I've told our farmers that I've discussed this with is, hey, you know, if you knew you were going to pay them, pay $400 and your margins were going to be above eight and you never got a payment, you'd be pretty darn happy. Um, as far as MPP dairy versus LGM dairy, if you enroll in MPP, you can't change your mind and then go back to LGM dairy. Once you're in MPP, you're in MPP. Now, for those folks that are in LGM dairy, if someone are, enrolls in LGM Dairy for 2015 and then decides for whatever reason in 16 to sign up for MPP, they can do that. But once they're in MPP, there's no going back. Uh, once again, that annual administrative fee for, of $100 is due every year during registration. 25% uh, of the premium due by February 1st of the coverage year, the balance June 1st, or we've had several producers that have just paid the whole thing right now. Uh, that is a, up to the producer and that is their option. And that concludes my presentation. And uh, I think the strategy was to hold any questions to the end. And I'd be more than happy to uh, answer them at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're, yeah, we're going to hold questions until the end of all the presentations. So um, who's up next? Next, I, I, I messed up here. My, Part of my instructions were to introduce my next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Sandy Buxton from Cornell Cooperative Extension. She 
is home based in Washington County and covers uh, uh, many other counties. So Sandy is on. Great, Sandy. We can see your uh, we can see your screen, and um, can we hear you? Oh, I need to. Nobody's answering. Hi, Sandy. We're sorry, we had some audio problems there. We got you now. That's okay. Hi. Hi, Jim. Hi, everybody. As Dave Hi. said, I'm, I'm with the Capital Area Ag Team for Cooperative Extension. I am covering just a little piece of the MPP program, and I'm talking about some strategies. Just to give everybody a little bit of a taste of, um, as Dave said, there's over 120 possibilities that you can do. And the one thing, uh, this, these are little pieces from uh, several of the presentations that have been done, webinars and various things, which in addition to the FSA MPP tool, uh, dairymarkets.org, O-R-G, is another website where you can go out and access some tools and resources, webinars, and uh, resource, uh, different types of handouts and things looking at the historical nature of the world, at least for the last 12 to 15 years, and what kind of decisions you might have made. Because, you know, even though past performance doesn't guarantee future success, we need to think about how are we approaching this situation. Because this is new for us to protect our dairy margins, to be a farm, and try to make those decisions. I think one thing that's very important for us as this webinar, the presenters on this webinar to stress is that the, the margin that we are talking about is the national margin. That may have very little relationship to your personal farm margin. And you need to understand what your numbers are as well as what the national numbers are and then how they relate to each other. So using some of Andy Novakovich's uh, information, here are some strategies for MPP. And we have these catchy names, if you're looking at my page. One, one clear strategy for, that some people are going to take is that it's not for me. They're, and they're not going to participate. We still would encourage you to sign up with FSA and document your production, because you never know. But it, you don't, nobody's forcing you to participate in this program. Uh, Katmandu. So catastrophic coverage, as Dave clearly defined, is the $100 uh, administrative fee. You can protect 90% of your milk. And, and that's sort of a keep it simple strategy. It's, it's, you can just do that. You don't have to worry about it. You may not get any type of um, assistance except for when things are really drastic. That's why it's called catastrophic coverage. It, and it's important for people to understand the margin protection program is not designed to be a money-making program for farmers. The, the concept is to help be a tool to help um, hold, a, hold things when, when the economy or, or the, the industry really goes, you know, running down a slope that you just can't help with. Uh, one of the presenters on some of the webinars, uh, Marin Bozic's comment was, this is a situation where you, you have to think about, you're not, you probably don't have car insurance where you, you're so excited that you've paid for your car insurance, you walk out to your car, you sit in your car, and you say, wow, I hope a deer hits me. Because you're not looking to actually total your car. You're hoping that you, you have the right to drive on the road, and you're going to do everything that you need to do. So we're just trying to make sure, or the program is trying to make sure that you're going to be hopping along, making milk, milking your cows, doing all the things that you do. And, but if things are really bad, like 2009, when we were sub $4 margin for quite a period of time, then there would be money available to help. Other people may choose to max it out. They may choose to pick a higher margin and uh, some, uh, something different in terms of production history. And 
with the goal of maximizing their net payments. Net payments meaning uh, amount of money coming in minus the, the premium that you had to pay. Now, some of the key things to really think about is to mimic MILC. You need to, if you want to be a, a farm that gets a payment sort of like what's been coming, then you need to be looking at signing up for uh, pay, uh, 550 margin at 90% for every year and just, and just planning for that. And then that would provide you, you're not second guessing, OK, is it going to be a good year or is it going to be a bad year? You've just committed, you've made that decision, and that's what you feel it should cost you to have that type of security. The budget plan is when you decide how much can you afford to spend in total premiums, because there's always that cost. Dave did the calculation so that everybody can see how you figure it out, um, versus how much you can afford to lose. So think, think about what's possible, what it might get you, and then choose your, your butt coverage levels to fit into that amount. And in some respects, that's also figuring in what do you think the year is going to be like. The price break model is that you pick the, pre pick the premium that has the, the, or pick coverage that has the most attractive premium. If you look very carefully at the prices that Dave showed on his slides, that 650 area is kind of a sweet spot. What happens is to get $7 margin coverage, the price, the, the amount of protection goes up 50 cents a hundred weight, but the cost goes up uh, the equivalent of 54 cents a hundred weight. So it's, it's, to get the higher levels is going to cost you more. And in some respects that makes sense. You're trying to cover a much wider area. You are more likely to have some type of a payout, and so the, uh, the premium ex cost is, is higher. Now, while you're thinking of the price break and how much, you know, if you're going to cover at 650, you have to also do that calculation of what percentage of your production history do you want to cover. Are you going to cover 90% or are you going to be happy if you cover 50%? Because now you know that, you know, 50% of your milk is going to be in the, in the right zone, so that gives you the ability to take take and um, be a little freer with the other 50%. Another choice is to cover my income over feed costs, IOFC. And you need to, again, choose your level of uh, production history that you want to cover. But if you know what your income over feed costs target is, then you can actually set that level and figure out what's going to work well for you. Um, and the final, the final strategy is not again. And I, I don't know if it should be not again or never again, but determine which of the previous years were bad for you. And then what kind of coverage would you have needed to make it through? Uh, understand that when you look at your milk price that you've received in the past, MILC money, that's, that's separate money. That's not really a milk price money. That was government money. So make sure that when you are doing your math, you take that into account. Now, this is a slide, and I apologize. They, they made bad choices for their colored choices in, in terms of one of the levels. But this is representing the last 12 years of production and what would have happened if MPP dairy was in effect versus the MILC program. And the so the this blue, the final um, bar on the graph, is the blue MIL steam money. And you can see, one, two, there was a tiny bit that paid in 2010, 2009, tiny bit in 07, 2006 there was a payment, 2004, 2003, 2002. But MPP 650 um, per hundred weight coverage level would have paid in 2013. 2012 for sure, up to almost $1.50 a hundred, would have paid in 2009, over $2, $2.20, would have paid some in 2003. Now, maybe not everybody remembers way back to that, but that actually was uh, another year of a challenge, and a little bit in 2002. 
that's important for everybody to think about what's been going on on these you know, almost three-year cy three cycles, 2012, 2009, 2006. We never, our margins actually weren't that bad, but price wasn't very good. 2003, bad margins. Um, the final one, which is the leftmost of the, the groupings of three, is MPP at $4. This is the catastrophic coverage levels. And when we look at this 12-year graph, we just want to take a look because there would have been a payment in 2012. It would have paid approximately $0.25, cents, 100 weight, and a payment in 2009 would have been just over $0.40. Cents. But that's it. It would have only paid twice in all of these 12 years. So for, for some people who aren't really sure as to what, what they need to do or what they're thinking about, they need to kind of think that through. Um, an additional thought as we look at this also is, is do you, you know, are, are you doing the numbers and, and checking all of the things that, that you need to do to know, and then what happens, what would have happened, and what could you have stood in terms of your farm business? You know, where did you need that payment? So take a, take a look and think about that. So here's a quick risk management budget example. For a farm having 4 million pounds of production history, they could enroll in the following combinations of coverage with premiums of about $5,000. So with an understanding that they are going to pay $5,000, they could have got $7 of coverage and protected 75% of their milk. They could have, or that second choice would be they could have gotten $7.50 of coverage for 55% of their milk. Or if they really wanted to try and put a blanket over everything, they could have gotten $8 coverage, the absolute maximum for the up to 4 million pounds, um, but only for 25% of their milk. So what, what would that look like? And if you think this through, 4 million pounds and you're paying $5,000, that total cost is about $12.05 a hundredweight. So the question that Andy poses is, do you need coverage to kick in more often? Or do you need to provide a bigger dollar per hundredweight payment if it is at the expense, you know, depending on the total magnitude of the benefit? You need to really think about that. Do you need little bits of money, or do you need to make sure that you're covering things when, when it's really bad? In the process of uh, getting things together for today, I was talking with him and his, and talking about the MPP classes that we've been doing across the state, and. The tool that is on the dairymarkets.org, and I assume the FSA site, updates every day. And his comment was, I hope people are looking at that tool right now and looking at what the projections are, because the, everything is kind of on a slide right this minute for what is being predicted for 2015. So it's very important to do your homework and do your history. And I think that's an excellent way to lead into Bill Zweigbaum, who's our next speaker, because he has some key points to talk about. OK, can you hear me and see my slides? Can you hear me and see my slides now? Yes, Bill, I can, I can hear you and see your slides. Thank you very much. OK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some things that are going on in the markets and then talk a little bit more about some uh, ways to, to look at this decision process. First thing that we need to be thinking about is what is the 2015 market going to bring to us? And, and the markets have really been crazy. Um, just this week, spot cheese prices are down about 8%. And yet the class 3 price has yet to really respond to that. Um, so, so we've got a lot of timing issues. Uh, in terms of domestic markets, we seem to, to really be out of sync with world markets. 
and our futures market seems to be out of sync with our spot markets for cheese and butter. So th this provides some real challenges to figuring out how the long-term market is really going to react to things. Um, you know, we've had time lags. We have a lot of political issues that uh, are totally separate from supply and demand in the marketplace that have tremendously large impacts on what happens to dairy pricing. Um, the European quota will be disappearing in about four and a half months, meaning that all members of the European Union will be able to make unlimited amounts of milk for the first time in over 30 years. That seems to be not too big a deal a few months ago because there was lots of export market for everyone. However, the Europeans sell a lot of their exports to Russia, and Russia put an embargo on dairy products as a result of the Ukrainian conflict, again, totally disrupting price structures and uh, milk movement without uh, anything that really related to, or I shouldn't say it didn't relate to supply and demand, but it uh, was an artificial change in demand. Uh, for the United States, China, is our major export recipient for dairy products, and China is a very hit or miss market. Uh, they change on a dime. Um, they are an unreliable trade partner, and so uh, our dependence on them means that we have a lot more volatility in our markets. New Zealand is a bit of a wild card being the major butter exporter of the world and they've been having uh, an excellent uh, startup to their seasonal year so far. And uh, that's put a lot of pressure on the supply side as uh, they've started really putting out a lot of product. And then the other piece of this puzzle has to do with a stronger US dollar and how that affects uh, our ability to export to other nations. And uh, we have seen a strengthening and uh, we expect continued strengthening based on uh, weaknesses in both China and Europe. That uh, could, could definitely become something of an issue for us, uh, remembering that uh, this past year our exports accounted for about 16 percent of all U.S. production. That means that uh, we now are much more subject to changes in export uh, demand affecting our domestic prices. So that's the dairy side of things. The other side of the formulas uh, in, in both LGM and MPP is the feed cost side. Uh, we went to some extremely low prices uh, at harvest time and uh, have already seen uh, some rebounds uh, in the grain markets just in the last month. Uh, corn prices actually are up about 12 and a half percent since their low point and uh, soybeans are up about 13 percent from their low point a month ago. So even though we have uh, a record large corn harvest uh, expected to be over 2 billion bushels, uh, which is the largest harvest in the last decade, and will provide us with an expected carryout that will be the largest in the last decade. We still have seen corn futures markets drifting upwards, and the soybean markets have followed that uh, to a slightly lesser extent. Uh, in terms of prices for dairy products, I, I mentioned that spot cheese was down 8% in the last three days. Um, but if you look back over a month, uh, we're down about 30% on butter and down 15% on cheese, almost 5% down on skim milk powder and about 6.5% down on dry whey, all in one month's time. So my big takeaway for everyone is that these markets have become exceedingly volatile and it makes guessing what the market six months or 12 months from now 
might be uh, nothing more than an educated guess that could be pretty far off. Taking all that information on where these markets are headed, what a farmer really needs to think about is number one, do they need protection? Some farms find themselves in a strong financial position where they can afford to self-insure. And in order to decide that, you've really got to look not only at your financial situation, but also at your personal risk tolerance. Um, and that's a number that can't be determined by anyone but the farmer themselves. If you look at the numbers uh, that uh, we anticipate at this point in time in the futures market, uh, the program on dairy markets and policy has a forecasting model out that shows about a 4% chance that there'll be any payments made from MPP next year, even at the $8 level. So that means that anticipated margins are strong for 2015. In fact, they average over $9 for the entire year and for each month. Um, so that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. Now, you could do the MPP minimum coverage, which is the $100 administrative fee, as has already been described. And you could do that at any time during the sign-up period, even if you are participating in LGM. So while it was stated that you cannot go back from MPP to LGM, if you have LGM contracts prior to your MPP sign-up, you can still pay your $100 administrative coverage and have MPP fall in as soon as your final contract under LGM has expired. So that gives you some flexibility if you want a strategy that uh, will span uh, a couple of different methods of managing your risk. And as always, there are independent ways to handle price risk. So you can still contract with your milk handler, and you can still contract with outside brokers uh, to protect your margins as well. And I have some farms who actually have done a combination of all four of those things for 2015, um, buying six-month contracts in LGM for a portion of their milk, um, paying their $100 administrative cost for MPP to kick in, once that LGM coverage expires, as well as also protecting about a quarter of their milk with the milk handler on an in-house program and buying some uh, future options on uh, the outside market. So all of those things combined can, can make your risk management plan as simple or as complicated as you feel it needs to be. When you're deciding, there's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, remember the MPP payment is up front where LGM is at the end of a marketing period. And so there are some differences in the cash flow requirements at the farm level. Also keep in mind, as was already described, that that first 4 million pounds of milk for MPP is, is subsidized pretty heavily. And especially in the upcoming year, uh, with the additional 25% discount, uh, that's really a very bargain price. For expansion farms, keep in mind that uh, your base years are the highest of 11, 12, or 13. And so if you've had a major expansion uh, within the program, you won't be able, within the MPP program, you will not be able to cover as high a percentage of your actual production as you may have liked to. So that may necessitate using a couple different techniques. And the other thing to keep in mind is that your on-farm margin may be very different than the national average. It was already described that the uh, margins that you're looking at for LGM coverage and the margins you're looking at in MPP 
coverage are calculated differently, and so you can't compare those two numbers apples to apples. But the other thing to think about is that because with uh, both of these programs we're talking about national average prices, that the effective protective margin for new, the Northeast is mostly greater than the national average. So that's somewhat of an advantage to us uh, in participating in these programs that are using national averages. Whereas on the west coast uh, of the United States, their effective protective margin is actually generally below the national average. As was already mentioned, uh, you've got a lot of combinations to choose from. I, I reduced it to actually 113 choices because uh, at the $4 level, you're going to pay the same premium whether you choose 25% or 90% of your milk. So it makes no sense to choose anything but 90% if you're going in for catastrophic coverage. But nonetheless, so uh, when you go to the FSA office, um, it sounds very simple because you're only picking two things. You're picking the uh, margin you want to protect and the percentage of your milk you want to protect. But the combination of those two things presents a lot of possibilities that do require thinking it through quite a bit. So strategies. If you're using MPP, it's already been discussed. Uh, to some extent, but I just want to review these a little bit. Um, you have a sweet spot at $6.50 because of the way the premium structure works. So that sweet spot really applies to those strategies where you're going to cover the same amount of milk year in and year out. In other words, if you're going to, on average, just cover $6.50, that is probably the sweet spot. But if you want to talk about a real sweet spot and talk about profit maximizing, the best strategy is an all-in, all-out strategy for MPP. So in other words, if you can look at the markets prior to the sign-up deadline in the fall of the prior year and anticipate that this is either going to be a good year or a bad year, and then determine that if it looks like it's going to be a good year and the odds are strong that uh, there will be little to no payouts, you'd want to go in at the $4 catastrophic level, pay your $100 to protect yourself, and call it good. However, if the futures markets look like the next year is going to be a very difficult year, as we saw when we entered 2009, I mean, the writing was on the wall, we didn't know how bad it was going to be, but the futures markets indicated it was going to be a very tough year. In a year like that, you would go all in and buy $8 coverage, pay a much larger premium, and that strategy would actually have a much better payout, or what I call a uh, return on premiums paid. Now, the biggest challenge is still all this unpredictability in uh, the markets and, and the fact that you're signing up for MPP over a year in advance of when the final outcome will be known. And futures markets definitely move a lot in that period of time. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, the different forecasting models, they, they really show by their confidence intervals that uh, futures markets that are more than six months from today's date are very unpredictable. So you're still making a best guess, but again, remember this is a risk management tool and needs to be tied back to how much can you absorb in terms of loss in a bad year and what have you got to protect to maintain cash flow and keep your business solvent and viable. So that's uh, kind of my quick summary of uh, both the market conditions and the strategies available. And I guess I turn it over now to Jim Putnam to take questions. Okay, thank you, Phil and Sandy and David and Allison. Now, a lot of information there and uh, uh, flowed pretty pretty logically from the uh, program details of both LGM Dairy and then the uh, MPP program. 
and uh, then some great discussion on strategy and implementing this into the risk management plan. So I really appreciate uh, the discussion. Uh, hopefully Chris has got the uh, phone lines opened up here to all the speakers. Uh, again, I'd encourage participants to uh, text in a question. I've got one. Uh, it's actually from Bill, and I'm going to uh, direct it to David. And uh, then if there are any additional questions, I, I, the next question will be from me to Bill. Uh, but uh, David, try this one. <clears throat> if you add a herd as a purchase, do you get their production history? Since the rules say the history is assigned to the operation and not the individual. Well, that is an excellent question. and. Um, I will answer it based on what I believe the answer to be, and then I'll put some qualifiers in there. Um, I believe that the answer would be yes, uh, because just as Bill states there, um, the history is assigned to the operation, not the individual. And at one of our training sessions um, in Syracuse, there was even a little discussion whether there might be uh, some value with the history. In other words, somebody, you know, if I'm going out of business, and you're buying my cows, trying to get a premium for my history, as you know, kind of like to do in Canada with selling quota, but um, not sure if that's actually going to occur or not. Uh, the the one thing that I would say though is um, when we have several situations in the in the four counties that I cover, um, is if you had any situations like this, or if you've had some mergers that have occurred. Um, since 2013, and we have a, several uh, examples where two farms have merged together, and maybe now, uh, you know, maybe the, our farm is going to be Zwigbaum LLC, and I'm bringing my cows, and maybe now Dave Hulk has a 10% share in that LLC. What we really need is all the details for people to come into the office, tell us all the details, and then we will forward the question on up to our state office in Syracuse. Uh, well, one of the reasons for that is um, we do not have a handbook for this program yet. We have very few instructions. Uh, we were trained uh, with PowerPoint that came back from Washington, D.C., but the actual regulations in printed form have not been issued. And uh, from my 30 years of experience, I know that sometimes things tend to change. And one real-life example that happened about two weeks ago is we had a situation like this and we asked the question because the, the thing is, okay, in some cases are we talking about one unit or two units? Can we combine production history? Do they remain separate? Uh, or, you know, is, that, is it considered a new operation and we go under new operation rules? Well, anyway, without boring you with all the details, sent the question up to Syracuse and our, and our specialist there uh, answered, the, answered my question based on how they were trained in Washington and how the training was presented to us. And in responding to me, they did a blind courtesy copy to the head of the program in Washington, D.C. And the head of the program in Washington, D.C. gave a totally different answer than our specialists did in Syracuse. Uh, of course, what I did was print it out, put it in the farmer's folder. But in this interim period when there is no handbook, if there's anything out of the ordinary, give us all the details that pertain to the situation as far as where the cows came from, the ownership, what the new entity looks like, and we will pass it on to the channels even if that's all the way to DC because um, at this time things are still changing, just like our deadline of November 28th to December 5th. It's a very long answer to a short question. So uh, the, the, I think the answer there, Dave, was uh, we'll, we'll wait and see on that one. Correct. A, a, a tentative yes, but we'll wait and see and, and get all our facts. But but there's a, there's several situations out there that are very similar to that. And what I'm what I'm hoping is, as the program gets established and the rules are written, that come next year we'll have a standard answer so that going forward in future years we'll know exactly how to answer these types of situations. Okay. Next question goes to Allison. Uh, can LGM premium be prepaid in 2014 instead of waiting until 2015 for the November and December contracts? Yes, if the um, 
the bill is set in stone when we uh, submit the contract. So we will know exactly what the bill is going to be, and we can give producers a copy of that bill for them to pay whenever they'd like. The December enrollment it might end up being a timing issue with actually being able to pay that before the first of the year, but if we know a producer wants a copy of their bill, we can provide that for them and they can pay it up front instead of waiting until when they receive the bill from the insurance company at the end of the contract. Okay, so I'm sure uh, the questioner is thinking of uh, tax planning opportunities uh, based on uh, 2014 earnings. Uh, again, uh, there is opportunity before we close out here to text the question in, but I'm going to ask the next one of, of Bill Z. Uh, Bill, you mentioned uh, ability to self-insure, and I think that's a very good concept uh, as we're having this kind of a discussion. Uh, so, you know, without uh, a real deep dive, how, what are the key indicators that uh, a dairy farm uh, business might have a pretty good uh, ability to uh, self-insure uh, rather than uh, deal with any of these programs. Okay, I guess if I was going to be talking to a farm about self-insurance, I would look at first, do they have historically strong earnings uh, with proven management? Number two, have they got a strong balance sheet? Because they may have strong earnings, but have gone through a recent capital expansion and, and weakened the, the strength of their balance sheet. And thirdly, I would look at what kind of liquidity or cash reserves does that farm have on hand, and how would a negative cash flow affect their business and their ability to make the kinds of decisions they want to be able to, to make without uh, being impeded by lack of capital. Okay, and I, I know Scott is trying to text us a question here, but uh, it's not getting through here, uh, Scott, so if you would resend that, uh, I will um, uh, get Bill to talk a little bit more uh, for the next minute or two, and uh, hopefully you can get your question through. I would just suggest you go open up uh, the uh, chat box and just send it again. So, Bill, my, my next question to you is uh, we've talked a lot about uh, how we're going to uh, make a decision on a variety of risk management options here. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, you know, this whole thing has really opened up. There's the traditional tools, the uh, that the uh, cooperatives are providing. There's uh, LGM Dairy, and now there's the uh, MMP uh, program. So uh, my question to you is, as, as you go forward, as a producer goes forward, uh, how would you uh, suggest that they monitor the effectiveness of these tools? I mean, the obvious answer is that you get a payment, but, you know, as a, as a good uh, business management um, uh, exercise and, and kind of uh, monitoring what you uh, referred to as return on premium, uh, how would you suggest that they go about uh, um, keeping track of how effective their strategy is? Okay, so if they're getting a uh, indemnity payment or making a profit on a hedging contract, that's what I would be measuring in terms of return on premium, and I would be converting that into a percentage basis to say, for the dollars I put into these premiums or these contracts, what percentage of a return did I get? And if it's a very small number, like one or two or five percent, then you would ask yourself the question, well, how much effort have I put in? And is that really the best use of my time? Uh, if you model this stuff uh, historically, though, you find that uh, the return on premium paid uh, over the last six years, if, say, this MPP program had existed for the last six years, and you had, had put in 90% of your milk at uh, six and a half dollars, that sweet spot we talked about, your return on premium paid actually would have been just over 100% for the six-year period. 
that tells you that that was, would have been a very wise investment to have made. Uh, you can also convert all of these things into, you know, a cost per hundredweight and then look at them relative to your own level of risk tolerance and ask yourself the question, you know, was that a reasonable insurance premium? You know, as Sandy said, you don't buy insurance necessarily wanting to collect it. You buy it wanting to protect yourself. And so, you know, if that number came out at 10 or 15 cents a hundredweight, then the individual farmer needs to ask themselves, do they feel that that level of cost was worth, you know, being able to sleep at night because they were protected? Okay. Uh, thank, thanks uh, for that, Bill. Uh, you're going to get the last question here. Uh, Scott's got his in. And uh, then I'm going to go back and ask each of the speakers to just do kind of a one-minute one closing comment, uh, and we will wrap this uh, program up for this afternoon. So, Bill, the last question, uh, please expand on the Northeast Advantage. And also, are there different considerations for high solids herd? Thank you. Okay, well, the Northeast Advantage really comes from looking at deviations between the pay prices and feed costs on northeastern farms as compared to that national average. And because we are in a higher class one utilization milk market, our average pay price runs considerably better than those U.S. national average uh, all milk prices. And that's where the advantage is really coming from, for the most part. There, there are some differences on the feed side as well, um, particularly when you look at uh, what's happened on the West Coast. And there was actually uh, recently a, a very good article on that in uh, Progressive Dairyman, uh, written by an attorney. I, I don't recall his name off the top of my head, but, but I found it uh, to be a real interesting read when I looked at it last week. Okay, what was the second half of the question? Oh, the second half, yeah. Are there different considerations for high solids herds? Well, yes, there, I mean, there would be some different considerations there because their pay price, again, is going to represent a much higher pay price than that national average. And so their margins uh, on farm effectively would be more greatly impacted by uh, the comparison to the national averages. And, and that would actually increase their effective net margin protected. Okay, uh, so I've got one last question. I'm going to let Chris read that, and then we're going to go to closing comments. Okay, Bill, um, seeing as this is a uh, LGM versus MPP uh, webinar, and we're comparing the two programs, I realize there's not going to be a single answer for every operation, but I've heard from some people that LGM dairy is more attractive during periods of high margins, and MPP looks more attractive during periods of low margins. Given that 2015 is looking to be a relatively high margin year, what do you think of the strategy of going with LGM for the next year, and then perhaps reevaluating switching over to MPP at a future, for a future year? Yeah, I think that's a very valid concept, and uh, I believe that anybody who feels that they have a need to protect the margin because the likelihood of a payout under MPP is so low in 2015 that in order to accomplish any sort of true risk management plan, uh, the way to go would be to use LGM. Um, but I would encourage uh, that farm to also register and pay their $100 administrative fee uh, for the mere reason that they'll get that bump that they've described, that 0.87% that bump in milk history, production history, uh, as a result of being registered, even though that registration is really uh, kind of uh, canceled out by the fact that they're actively participating in LGM. Okay, and, and I'm going to add on to the top of that the uh, kind of 
you know, our attorneys told us to say this, but uh, every, every farm is different, needs to make their own decision. And, of course, there's a, uh, uh, as, as Bill and others have indicated here, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, in what the outlook for next year is going to be. So uh, everybody needs to make their own decision, and uh, we at Farm Credit East are not uh, advocating one position over the other. So with that, let's go to uh, closing comments. Uh, Allison, uh, uh, a parting comment here for today. Yes, I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, just want to encourage you, if you are interested in looking at LGM Dairy, to start taking action on that so you can get involved in the enrollment next Friday if it's something you decide you want to do. Because we've seen very strong margins over the past uh, several months, and we're still seeing fairly good margins for what is available to protect into 2015 right now. But we've talked a lot about that uncertainty and who knows how long um, those good margins will last and you'll be able to protect those good margins using LGM dairy. And there are um, even more combinations of enrollment than MPP with LGM. So there's a little bit more decision making involved. So giving at least a week of a discussion time with your crop insurance agent would be beneficial to you. Thank you, Allison. And I know you had a lot to do with getting this organized today, so really appreciate your uh, effort on uh, helping us get this uh, information out to uh, producers and other interested uh, folks. Uh, David, uh, uh, thanks for being with us today. You want to give us a closing comment? You're welcome. Yes, uh, just um, MPP Dairy does go through uh, 2018. The, the rates are set. Uh, just to, once again to uh, encourage everyone to establish their production history for with your uh, documentation of your 2011, 2012, and 2013 production. And then if you want to register uh, for this year, the deadline is now December 5th for 2015. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, the MPP tool I think is a, a good tool. You can play around that with that at home. We've had several producers that aren't comfortable with a computer or don't have internet access. If you want to go to your local FSA office, we've been more than happy to put in your uh, actual production history and let you play around and change the different levels of protection and the different um, margin levels and show you what the premium would be, print that out with you. Uh, you know, we'll give you the information that you need to hopefully make a good decision for your dairy. Thanks again, Dave. I just want to, uh, you know, reinforce the comment that uh, David and several other people have made here today. You know, there's really some great online tools here, and uh, those links are on, on our Knowledge Exchange uh, website at, uh, or, or page uh, at farmcredities.com, so you can get the, the hot link there and click into uh, those tools and uh, uh, in terms of other programs I've seen over the course of my career, uh, you know, this is the, the first time we've really had uh, great uh, digital tools to help us work through all the uh, different options on these programs. Sandy, you get the award for boiling the most uh, insight into that first slide uh, that you showed with the different strategies there. Uh, thanks uh, for that because I think it really uh, provide some focus on, you know, uh, getting out of the details of these different programs and really thinking about what you're trying to accomplish. So uh, uh, appreciate your participation here today, and you want to give us a closing comment. I will, but I will take absolutely no credit for that first slide. That is Dr. Andy Novakovich. That was his slide. I stole it, borrowed it, whatever you want to call it, um, because it's important for everybody to see. So my key points that I think that people should do as a takeaway is know your numbers. Do your research, know your numbers, know what you think might be going on. Irrespective of where the, the price is going, know what's going on. Know what you need to be getting in order to survive and succeed and thrive. And then generate a plan. That's, that's really important, whether it's one of these tools that we've talked about, or as Bill talked about, a self-insurance situation, whatever. Put, put something together. Get your toolbox out and, 
and fill it with the things that are going to make it work for you. And then the, the, the side comment that goes with that is, when you're at Stewart's and you're talking to your neighbor, don't just assume that what your neighbor is telling you or has decided to do is going to be appropriate for you because everybody's situation is different. Everybody's in a different place with their world, their dairy, with how their cows are. And you really need to know what your, you know, where you are so that you can figure out how to get to where you want to be. Thank you. Right. Again, thank you. Thanks, thanks for being so honest. Uh, geez, if you've been running for Congress, you probably would have uh, claimed that you'd invented that in the last five minutes, right? <laughs> thanks, Sandy. Uh, Bill, closing comment. Boy, it's bad going last. Uh, most of my closing comments have been taken. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the loneliest position on the program, isn't it? <laughs> But, but I will just reiterate, uh, number one, that o only the farmer can really decide what's the right decision for his farm. And uh, the other thing I was going to say, Sandy grabbed from me too, and that is you really need to know your cost of production and your income over feed costs to start with so that you can make a uh, valuable decision that uh, is based in, in knowledge of your existing production system. Okay, with that uh, great comments, I'm not going to uh, add on. Again, our thanks to the presenters today. They've done a wonderful job. And I want to thank all the participants uh, for spending um, uh, more than 90 minutes with us this afternoon. We always appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, share some information we learned from your questions and your participation as well here at uh, Farm Credit East and Crop Growers Insurance Agency. Uh, so. Uh, uh, we all all get something out of the bargain. Uh, with that, Chris, any closing comments as to uh, uh, when this will be posted and so forth? Again, my thanks on behalf of uh, uh, both organizations to those who participated today. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Um, the recording will be posted. It will be up online by Monday. Um, it's at farmcreditease.com slash webinars. That's where all our information on all our webinars, past, present, and future, lives. Um, and uh, the Dairy, um, Dairy MPP and LGM tool is available on our home page. On the right-hand side of the screen, there's a section that has Farm Bill information, and all the information on Farm Bill programs that we have is posted there. Um, I guess that's it, and I thank you for attending, and we're adjourned. Okay, thanks.